Finally, let's talk about staffing and other personnel considerations, which of course are also important in managing a project and keeping it on track. Staffing a project, of course, includes determining how many people should be assigned to the project, which is usually done on a task-by-task -task basis, which implies you need to match people's skills with the needs of the project, you need to motivate them to meet the project's objectives, and you want to deal with conflict by trying to minimize conflict over time. This part of project management is typically called a staffing plan. Developing a staffing plan really is not a science, or I guess I should say it's both a science and an art. One approach is to figure out, begin with, based on previous experience or just estimates, the the total number of people that you, you will need, and then base your estimates on, on that, or, or said a different way, you want the right number of people on a project. If you had unlimited resources and you could assign as many people as in the world, that's not going to necessarily bring you productivity gains. In fact, it's well known in team-based project development efforts like this, the more, the more people that you add, the productivity per person falls. And there have been studies that have shown that when you have, you have sub-teams that exceed, say, eight people, that productivity falls. That is, if you have a re very large project, you should break it down into sub-teams. Consider the fact that when two people are on a sub-team, for them to communicate, they just talk to each other. When four people are on a sub-team, though, suddenly you have six lines of communication. So the communication structure becomes more complex with each person you add to a sub-team. Once the project manager understands how many people, what is the optimum number of people for the entire project, then he or she can create a staffing plan that lists the roles that are required for the project and the proposed reporting structure for the project. Now, you need a balance of technical people, that is programmers, database designers, that sort of thing, and business analysts who better understand the business requirements of the system. You don't want a completely technical team, but certainly you, you do need some technical people on it. What about motivation? Why do we care about motivation? Well, part of the project manager's responsibility is to keep the, the staff, the project staff, motivated. And this is more of an art than a science. Surprise, you might be surprised to, for me to say that just throwing money at them never works. The more money you throw, the more they expect. And if it doesn't come, ac come across the wire, you, their morale and motivation will fall. If people are paid fairly, which is really the best you can do, you have to deal with what are sometimes called intrinsic rewards. Recognition, achievement, putting people on the project who actually like that sort of work, giving them responsibility and, 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 and paths for advancement. But of course, with responsibility comes um, accountability, you need to talk to your staff and see what they want to do. The best managers I ever had were managers who would listen to me, what I wanted to do, and they would try to find roles that, that met my desire to perform certain work and my expectations. You can't just slot people anywhere you want them. You have to have them, their ownership, you have to have them to buy into the project as well. These things are certainly demotivators. Unrealistic deadlines. If I had a quarter for every time I heard someone on a project team complain or quit, stating this project manager just doesn't know what he or she is doing, they always set unrealistically short deadlines that can't be met and they because they don't really understand what needs to be done. That is a recipe for a disaster, setting unrealistic deadlines. You, you must reward good efforts, not only money, money certainly will play a role there, but 
attaboys come in handy too. You don't want to accept a low quality product. That, that is a demotivator for sure. You don't want to give everybody the same raise, which often happens in large government agencies, for example. You want to listen to your project team and have them participate in the decision making. Again, there's, there's no sure recipe or paint by numbers approach to assuring group performance, but you want to keep everybody clear on the project and its goals and its, pro, its progress for sure. And too many meetings is bad, but you need some meetings and you, you need to be available yourself to speak to people when they want to see you. Um, the best managers I had would organize things occasionally on weekends or they take us out to lunch, everybody, or, you know, things out of the office to try and get people to get along and to like each other. You also have, will have to deal with conflict. That's a fact of life. What this chart is meant to represent is that there is a, often a wide margin of error for the estimates of cost and scheduled time early in, a pro, early in a project. And this one author cited here, Barry Bohm, Barry Bohm, says that in the initial planning phase, often the cost is underestimated by 400% and that the scheduled time may be short as much as a third or 60, 60%. That is, you need 60% more time. But note that if you revise these estimates as you go along, they come more in line with less air. So the notion is, as you complete each one of these phases, or better yet, the steps within the phases, take a look back, see what your initial estimate was, compare the actual progress in terms of cost and time spent, and revise the future accordingly. Don't just assume you're going to catch up. If you have a cost overrun, a time overrun early, don't assume that you're going to catch up. It's, in fact, you, you won't. You, you should increase the time, cost and time estimates for the subsequent phases. But note that if you do this, if you monitor, monitor it and revise it, that towards the end of the project, your cost estimates and, and time estimates will probably be more in line with reality. Scope creep or feature creep is the bane of all projects, and it always happens, where you get well into, say, a large-scale waterfall system development life cycle approach, and you're in the implementation phase, and the client, the person you're developing, the group you're developing the system for, comes up and says, you know what, Jeff? I forgot to tell you early on, we have this other set of requirements that just have to be incorporated in this. This is always going to happen. And that's one reason why you want to have the requirements document nailed down and signed off on very early so that if, they, if there is a need, an urgent need to address new requirements that somebody pay for it, that the client pay for it. Um, the documents serve to fence out additional requirements, the early documents. And this is a very real problem. So there are various ways you can manage scope, but formal change orders is a good way. But the best way is try and get them all in, in the front. And regardless of whether you do or not, have an agreement with the client that if more come up, we need more time. To combat time overruns, time boxing is used. Time boxing just says we have nine months, for example, we have nine months to develop this and we're going to do it in nine months. And if we get into it three months and we realize we're not going to make it, we're going to start leaving stuff out so that we can still make it, we can hit our nine month goal. And there's a trade-off, of course. You'll deliver the system on time, which is a rarity, but it won't do everything that you thought it would do to begin with. Again, you miss a target date, time overrun, you probably won't catch up. You should not just throw more people at it. You should probably 
elongate your estimates for the for the later phases, steps, and specific tasks, and or reduce the complexity, cut some things out, do a little surgery on the scope that you were going to tackle to begin with so that it's more reasonable and so that you can deliver on time and within budget. Those are the two goals, on time and 